Hi, my name is Dershan Doshi. I'm an interventional cardiologist at the Massachusetts General Hospital. I help direct the complex therapeutics program there. Today, I have the distinct pleasure of talking to you about rotashock and rototripsy. Those are alternative names for the use of rotational atherectomy combined with the use of intravascular lithotripsy. Here are my disclosures. And so I think the best way to highlight the utility of the combination of rotational atherectomy plus intravascular lithotripsy is to go through a case where you'll see the benefit of why the combination of the two um, are very helpful. So the first case is a case of a 65-year-old male with a history of alcohol cirrhosis for which he underwent uh, a long time of abstinence and then underwent uh, a liver transplant in 2020. Uh, unfortunately, he also has end-stage renal disease for which he's on hemodialysis. Um, he has a known history of CAD. He's had a remote cath in the past uh, where he was found to have an RCA and LED disease. Um, he has a history of paroxysmal AFib with uh, intermittent bouts of SVT, and he also has COPD with four liters O2. Um, and he presented to an outside institution with pneumonia, and his course was actually complicated by AFib with RVR and NSTEMI. Once he was treated for the pneumonia, the patient was then brought over to our institution for coronary angiography due to chest pain that uh, he was having at rest and also whenever he underwent hemodialysis. So I'm gonna show you his diagnostic films. So here you obviously have pictures of the left system and what you can start to appreciate is that he has some left main disease with deep calcium, which you can see over here. He has LED disease that's sort of highlighted. You can also see calcium in the circumflex uh, with some mild disease distally. And these are orthogonal projections of the left system. Again, the LAD is the area that you can see as fairly significant disease. And when the contrast doesn't fill, you can see that there's a significant degree of calcification there. So this is an AP cranial. And what you see is this is his LAD right here coursing. There may be even a subtotal aspect to the LAD. And it's somewhat tortuous. And this is another orthogonal picture here. And so just to round out the pictures of his left system, uh, the main disease is predominantly in the LAD. Um, some disease distally in the CERC, but probably not something that's flow limiting. Um, there's some calcification in the left main, but at least in these projections, the area of the left main is probably fine that we don't need to do anything about it. Now, this is his uh, right system, which you're going to see. So in contrast to the left, which had a lot of coronary artery disease, the right also has a lot of coronary artery disease and uh, has uh, a lot of calcification. Specifically, if you look at the mid portion of this vessel, also it looks like there's a, nearly a subtotal occlusion there. You can see the calcification all the way through the proximal to mid portion of the artery. And so again, just to round out his diagnostic imaging, again, this is a vessel that we would have to tackle. And so before taking the patient off the table, there was a thought that if he has severe calcific disease, uh, the fact that he has a hemodialysis, uh, whether or not his hemodynamics would tolerate us intervening on his vessels uh, without some form of hemodynamic support. And so this is just a iliac angiogram which surprisingly also shows that he has significant calcification in his uh, arterial, uh, his, in his iliacs as well. So the plan was to go after his RCA. So let me ask you, you saw the RCA. What do you think the reference uh, size is for the RCA? So I'm gonna try to go back and play it again and tell me what you think the, uh, the reference diameter here would be for the vessel. Yeah, so, yeah, so I, I, I agreed with you. I thought that the 2.5 millimeter vessel probably makes the most sense given that catheter size. But the issue, like you said, is that there's, it's underfilled. So there's an area where there's a subtotal occlusion, probably a calcific occlusion. And the other thing that you see is that it's only uh, partially filled and it has both deep and superficial calcium. And so the size may potentially be a lot bigger than we anticipated being and intravascular imaging is paramount, just as you stated. 
So what we did is we went with a temp wire and we have a workhorse wire. This is his dialysis catheter. Um, the patient was getting CVVHD as a result of the fact that he could not tolerate regular hemodialysis at the time. And so we wired this and our thought was because you have both superficial and deep calcium, we're gonna have to do some form of calcium uh, ablative solution in order to really be able to expand our stents. So our thought was to perform uh, rotashock or rotatripsy. And the rationale behind that is to do atherectomy to take care of the deep calcium and then be able to deliver your shockwave balloon, which can then be sized one to one with the vessel to take care of the very deep calcium. Because what you're not going to be able to affect is the deep calcium. If you were to use just uh, rotational atherectomy, what you would have to do is you would have to start off with a 1.5 burr, then go to a 175, then a 2.0, and size up if you really wanted to try to get to it. And even then, with rotational atherectomy, you're biased in one line. And so it's wherever the wire is. So you're only going to get a, uh, you're only going to shave off a, a corner of the true um, 360. And so you're not really going to be able to get to it. You could potentially get to it with orbital atherectomy. With orbital atherectomy, it has some uh, ability to get to the medial calcification, but it, you would have to run it multiple passes, very high speed. And in my hands, I've definitely had perforations. And so I think for me, the safest route would be to use uh, rotational atherectomy to create space, to then bring my shockwave balloon, inflate it one-to-one. -one. That way I've dealt with a lot of the superficial calcium with the rotational atherectomy and the deep calcium with the um, IVL balloon. Yes, please, of course. Yeah, so what I do is when I do uh, rotational atherectomy, the vast majority of people who do rotational atherectomy always use a 125 or a 15 burr. The shape of the two burrs are a little bit different in the fact that the 125 is more bullet shaped um, and the 15 burr is more of a football shaped. So the 125 is more likely to get trapped. The 15 is more likely not to get trapped, but is less likely to cross sometimes. So for me, I just want to create space so that I can get my um, IVL balloon because the IVL is really going to do a lot of the heavy lifting for us. So what I decided was to just go with a small burr and use a 125 burr. But even to get the wire through um, and to be able to exchange and get, put a microcatheter down and then exchange it for a rota floppy wire, we had to do some small balloon work. So we use a very low profile 1.5 millimeter balloon to generate a little bit of space so our microcatheter could go down and then be swapped out for a rota floppy wire. The other thing that you see is up front, we put up a, a temporary pacemaker because we knew we were gonna have to atherectomize. Now, the role of a pacemaker is somewhat controversial with atherectomy, uh, but of the right, I think it was just the safest thing to do, so we went ahead and did it. So we used a 1.5 balloon, created a little bit of space, and then once we were able to create that space, I was able to get a microcatheter down and then switch out for the rota floppy and take our workhorse wire, okay? And so here, again, is the area that we really want to target. And this is the rotational atherectomy that we're doing. And so again, it's a 1.5, because you can see it, I sorry, 1.25, it's a bullet shape, not a football shape. And small pecking motions, just as you get close to it, to make sure that there aren't D cells. So whenever I do rotational atherectomy, my starting rates are usually around 160 to 170 K. And if I'm having problems crossing, even at that number, then we increase it more substantially to uh, 200 and even 220. So we went at 170K, and the main thing is not to have D cells. You don't want D cells uh, less than 20K at any uh, time. And so we did several passes, and ultimately we were able to get through the calcium. And again, I'll just play the video for you. Sort of highlights small pecking patterns, and each time making a little bit more progress making sure not to let it jump through. And there you see that we were able to get through the tightest area, which we can both see, you know, without even any dye that is probably close to this area here. Okay, so we're making several passes here and some final polishing runs, just so that we can deliver our balloons to where they need to go. Okay, then afterwards, then you're able to go ahead and deliver your balloons. So we know that this vessel is calcified, we're gonna to have to probably deliver 
IVL from probably down here up to here. Um, one of the things that I didn't show you is that for any of our calcium cases, we always use 100% uh, intravascular imaging. And the intravascular imaging is paramount because it really tells you, um, it, it informs you the need to perform uh, ablative therapies, but it also informs you if you've actually cracked the calcium and if you're able to uh, go ahead with stenting. And so here, what we found was what you said earlier, the size of the vessel I thought was a 2-5 vessel was actually a 3-5 vessel. And it doesn't look like a 3-5 vessel. I, I didn't think it was going to be a 3-5 vessel either. But based on IVIS, once we got the rota through and we went ahead and IVIS distally, we found out that it was a 3-5 vessel. And approximately, it might even be a 4-0 vessel. So what we did was we got a 3-5 shockwave balloon down, sized it one-to-one, -one, and then started delivering pulses. Um, and, you know, each balloon has 80 pulses, so we delivered 80 pulses all the way back um, and then started inflating up. So this is us distally, more proximally, starting to open. You start to see that this is starting to open, and this is the area that was the most recalcitrant, and that's starting to give as well. And here we're continuing to work. Same thing. And again, delivering pulses very methodically. And again, there are two sensors. And so you want to line up the sensors to the areas you really want to target. Um, and because that's where it has the greatest impact. And again, we kept doing that until we were able to get full expansion. And then once we were able to get full expansion, then we went ahead and we did a, a small contrast um, angiogram just to make sure there were no perforations or any sort of uh, technical issues that we had to deal with. And then after that, we started to put our stents from distally to proximally. And so we went with the three, five stent. Yep. It, it, no, there's, so there's one sensor that's two millimeters from one end and another sensor that's four millimeters from one end. And they're about six millimeters apart. You want the sensor closest to the area where you really want to do the most work. And either sensor doesn't matter. The, the, the proximal or distal sensor still gives you about the same uh, delivery. So you don't have to worry about that. So then we went ahead and stented, post dilated further. So I used the dedicated 3.5 balloon to high pressure and then proximally also dilated. And this is the final result of this side. So this is what the vessel ultimately grew to be. Um, despite the fact that they had significant calcification, it was a subtotal uh, vessel. You basically see that this is now a 3.5 vessel which we thought was maybe a 2025 at the beginning. And, you, and the reason we were able to do this is because we were able to leverage rotational atherectomy to get our IVL balloon to where it needed to go. The IVL did the heavy lifting for us, and then we were able to stent um, as we needed to. And again, these are just orthogonal views here of uh, our right coronary artery. So remember, he not only had right coronary artery disease, but he also had LAD disease. So, you know, after we did this, he was, he no longer had rust paint. He was able to undergo dialysis um, for some period of time. But then once he got better, he started to push himself, exert himself, and then he would have symptoms with just simple exertion, okay? So at that time we said, well, the LED needs to intervene, uh, needs to be intervened upon. And moreover, we saw the strategy that worked well for the right coronary artery. Why don't we just use the same strategy for the LAD? And so for the LAD, um, what I always do is whenever I bring the patient back, I take a look at our old work just to make sure there's nothing that's changed, nothing that we need to touch up. And here, it look, maybe looks even better than when we left it, uh, to be quite honest. Um, specifically the distal edge, which I think um, has sort of uh, grown a lot more. Yeah, so, yeah, I, yes, uh, there's some, and maybe the quality isn't that great. Um, but with that being said, and we're not staying on long enough, but you see kind of something start to fill in a little bit late at the uh, angiogram. So same thing, we wired. Now this curve, it's important to remember this curve. So it's going straight down and you got a curve and then you're wiring. Again, if I had to ask you, what do you think the caliber of this vessel is? What would you say? 2.5, right? Maybe, right? It's, it's uh, a male. It's a prox LED, so you know it at least has to be two fives, right? Potentially more. Okay, same thing. Balloon with a one, two, uh, one five balloon, just to create space uh, for a microcatheter to go down. 
a microcatheter goes down, gets swapped out to a rotafloppy, and then we do atherectomy proximally to distally. So again, the same sort of technique, very slow passes, a pecking motion, um, coming back, making sure it doesn't jump across it so that it, it gets stuck, um, and then you can't bring it out. So very slow, methodical moves. And we're basically gonna atherectomize from the start to around that curve. That curve is something I don't wanna travel because of the anatomy. And so again, these are more passes of rotational atherectomy that we perform. Again, sort of in a pecking fashion, back and forth. And then here um, we IVIST. And for the IVIST, what we found out was this was also uh, over here, it was a 3 -0 vessel and over here it was a 3-5 vessel. So again, massively undersized, uh, if it would be massively undersized if we didn't use intravascular imaging and do what we needed to, to address both the superficial calcium and the deep calcium. So we were able to do that. Um, we, I wanted to go with the largest balloon possible for the IVL. So just to make a little bit of space, we used a 2-5 NC just to create space so I can go with the 3-5 um, shockwave balloon. And then we started doing our shockwave. Yeah, yeah. It just, it's just to make sure that as we did our inflations that there wasn't plaque shift and didn't shut down um, those small diags that were there. And so ultimately we used uh, a three, five balloon from, um, from the mid to the prox uh, for the IVL um, and even into the left main. And then once we were able to do that, we then went ahead with our stenting. So we stented from the mid to the prox, and then further. And then ultimately, this was the final result that we got. Okay. So again, this is a vessel that you thought was a 2 0 vessel. The result was possible mainly because we were able to deliver our IVL balloon. But in order to deliver the IVL balloon, you have to create a little bit of space. And the way we did that was with the rotational atherectomy. And by leveraging the two, this is the result we were able to get. We were able to get both the superficial calcium as well as the deep calcium. Um, more recently, if, you, if you're interested, just a, um, uh, just a few months ago, uh, this was published specifically on rhodotripsy. It's a case series that came out of the US um, looking at the use of rotational atherectomy and IVL in uh, calcified coronaries. And you're gonna see cases like this um, and how they took care of them as well. Um, so I'll stop here and take any sort of questions that you guys may have. So the question is, how does IVL fit into my treatment algorithm? When do I use one modality versus IVL? So in my treatment algorithm, I basically, I'm looking for three things. One, I want to do the case as quickly as possible. Two, I want the case to be done as safely as possible. And when I'm able to get all of that, then the third thing I think of is sometimes to do it as cheaply as possible. So the financial aspects of it. So how do I uh, look at all three of those things? So I know, at least from the Disrupt CAD3 data, that the likelihood of having a coronary perforation is much lower with IVL than it is with the two atherectomy systems. So if I'm concerned about a high perforation risk, IVL is something that I'm gonna use before I use um, any of the atherectomy systems. The second aspect is, you know, I um, is, is when to use, say, one atherectomy system versus another. So when you're going to use Rota, the reason I use Rota now is just to make sure that I can deliver my, um, my IVL where it needs to go. And so it's basically to really just create a path and a shape um, and then sort of go from there. Now, if there's a calcific nodule in the past, um, I thought that orbital atherectomy might be superior because it has that orbit and even though there's an eccentric nodule, um, you can access that. Whereas with rotational atherectomy, you may be biased against one wall and not the nodule. Um, but we know from the data that was um, released today at TCT that IVL does a fantastic job of dealing with, um, with eccentric calcific nodules as well. So ultimately, it really comes down to how do I do this fast? A balloon system, I think, is faster for me than setting up an atherectomy system, making sure it works switching out the wire, delivering the atherectomy system, taking the wire out. So for speed, IVL, I think, is very high. The second aspect is the safety aspect. 
again, I, you know, in my hands, I've had more perforations with atherectomy devices than I have with IVL. So that checks that off. And the fourth is from a financial perspective. And now that, you know, there are that, you know, the NTAP and other pathways where you at least break even. And now, you know, if you're working with um, some of the new coding, you'll probably make money on the device. You're not losing money on the device, which is also another reason why um, I think IVL is important here.